that door. Amen. Let's stand this morning, and if you'd like to open your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. Second Timothy 3, starting at verse 13. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And you must continue, but you must continue with the things which you have learned. This is Paul talking to his protege, Timothy. Paul is Timothy's mentor in the Lord. So continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them. He sat at the feet of his mother and his grandmother who were both believers. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. Amen. Let's bow. Father, I thank you for this text this morning. Yes. And Lord, only you and I know the pathway mm -hmm. that it took for me to arrive to this text. And I was so grateful, Lord, when you gave it to me. I know, Lord, it has a special meaning for someone and for some bodies in this church today. And I pray that you would just speak, illuminate the heart. Yes. And God, that if it, there needs to be a correction, if there needs to be a reproof, if there needs to be something that will encourage someone, something profitable that leads to a greater knowing of righteousness, whatever it is, God, let your word do the complete work in us and bring us to the place where you are well pleased with each of us. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be As I mentioned in the reading of the text, Paul was a mentor to Timothy. And these just so happen to be some of the last words that he was speaking to Timothy. Timothy was elsewhere. He was in Rome. He was in chains. He was in bondage. And he was about to go to his to his death, and his crime had been that he had promoted the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I guess I need to turn. His crime had been that he had, uh, you might want to tone me down just a little bit, got a kind of an automatic uh, monitor in, in my voice. His crime had been that he had been a follower and a promoter of Jesus Christ. That was his crime. It was against the law, evidently. In the Roman times, in the first century. And so he was speaking these last words to his protege, Timothy. And there were some things during this uh, letter of the four chapters of 2 Timothy that he wanted to convey to Timothy because he knew he was leaving. Timothy would carry on in his stead and it was very important that he pass on some very vital instruction to him. And he said, what's coming is there's going to be a lot of religious deceivers. There's going to be a lot of people that pose as Christians, pose as believers, pose as leaders, but in fact they're going to be imposters. And he said, you need to be able to tell the difference between those who are legitimate, those who are genuine, versus those who are illegitimate, who are counterfeit. You need to understand how to determine that and how to discern that. And one of the great ways, one of the litmus tests, and you need to hear this, saints, 
The litmus test of those who are real and genuine are in what they say so oftentimes, in the things that they convey. And I've been so acquainted with the Word of God since I was a little boy, I started reading the Word of God. And I don't know how many times I've read it through many times in the New Testament, many, many, many times. And now this year again, I'm reading through it again. And so I've, I've become very familiar and, and no day goes by that I don't get into the Word of God. It's just a matter of habit and discipline in my life. And why is that? One of the big reasons is I want to be able to discern right from wrong. I want to be able to discern uh, those that would attempt to teach me as to whether they are good or whether they're evil, whether they're right on or whether or not they've skewed off path just a little bit. You see, it doesn't take much. It only takes a one percentage of, of, of error to get us off into the netherworld before long. When they send those rockets to the moon, when they sent those to the moon, listen, they had to be absolutely precise. They couldn't even be off one nth of one degree. Because if they did, over 240,000 miles, that thing would have completely missed the moon and shot off into outer space. They had to be right on with that perfectly zeroed in on the moon. And so we could say, oh, come on, just a, just a little bit of doctrinal error won't hurt us, will it? Well, why don't you try telling the rat that just ate some poison that's got just 1% arsenic in it? Just a little bit. Just a little bit of arsenic in there. There's just 1%, so you can't put a load of arsenic in there, or the rat won't eat it. He'll know something's wrong, so they just put enough in there, just a little bit, to paralyze him and to, and to bring his early death. That's what's going on in the world today. There's, there's things, they sound good, they look good, you know, and they got all the bells and whistles, but, they're, but if you've got your hearing on, if you've got your Holy Spirit ears on, if you understand and know the Word, you know when you hear something that's off kilter. And the Spirit will say, whoa, what was that? See, I don't want to, I don't want to be adhering to any error at all. I want to know the truth. That's why I tell people, I said, never just take my word at face value. Get into the word of God so that you know yourself that what I'm saying is the truth. I don't want you just to follow me like some Jim Jones out there or some David Koresh. I look at some of the things that those people of David Koresh and Jim Jones, some of the things they got into. I mean, Jim Jones was a known homosexual practicing homosexuality among the men there of his congregation. And the people knew it. I don't think there's anybody in this building that could be fooled by that. You would know, whoa, wait a minute. That's not scriptural. That's not truthful. That's not right. That's not according to the plan of God. You'd know that. David Koresh, he forbid all of the men of his, of his congregation, several hundred, to have sexual relations with their wives even. But he himself, he said, but I, as for me, I can have sex with your wives and your children. Now, if I'm in, the, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I would have spent one day with David Koresh. I don't think it would have taken very long for me to realize, man, this guy, he is full of it. Of something and not anything that I want. Are you hearing me this morning? Now those are obvious things, but the Bible says, Paul said, in the last days, it's going to get worse and worse. Men are going to be, become more adept and more cunning at being deceivers, and you've got to be careful with that. You've got to be careful because they themselves are deceived. You see, David, of course, I believe he believed what he said was the truth. And there are people still to this day that was in that campground and saw the outcome of that group back in Waco, back in the 1990s, that still believe he was a man of God and a prophet of God, knowing what they know. But see, we are, we've not been called into this kingdom to be deceived 
Amen. Even Jesus himself in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, one of the great warnings that he told again and again, he said in the last days, and he gave the description of what it's going to look like. And by the way, it looks like everything he talked about, it looks like it's going on right now. And he said, above all, be not deceived, because there's going to be deceivers walking around. And many saying, I am Christ, and meet me here and meet me there, or I've seen Christ over here. He said, believe it not, when I come, it's going to be in an instant. It's going to be like the lightning that shine it from the east to the west. It's going to come in a moment. If anybody ever comes to you and says, I think we have found the Christ. He's over here in a McDonald's. He's having a Bible study, right? I think you can know that's a deceiver. See, but you got to know the Word to know that in order to have understanding. And so the litmus test is what does God's Word say versus what they say? See, that's my comparison. The true person of God will be both spiritually adept and they will be literate in the Word of God. Not illiterate. Do you hear me? They'll be literate. They'll understand the Word of God. They'll be able to read it and and discern it and teach it and preach it under the unction and the anointing of the Spirit of God. You see, if I'm going to be in a congregation, if I'm going to be where you're sitting, I don't want to be in a church or a congregation in which the man is, he's a great philosopher, he's a great psychologist, you know, he's very learned and he's got all kinds of degrees and letters behind his name, but he doesn't understand and and discern the Word of God as the Spirit of God gives utterance. I don't want to be in that church. I want to be in a church that understands the Holy Spirit and the movings of the Holy Spirit, but also is very literate in the Word of God. You don't hear me preaching psychology. You don't hear me preaching philosophy. When I preach, I preach the Word of God. Can somebody say amen? Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Recently, Nancy and I was sitting in our living room, and I had on a, a Christian station. I was listening to a very well-known, charismatic uh, minister, and he was uh, was reading reading letters that had come into the station, and people had different concerns, and, and I felt such compassion for this one woman that wrote in, and she, she had a, a heartbreaking story about her teenage daughter. She had a daughter that was 18 years old, and she just said, she said, my daughter was raised in church, raised in a Christian family. We had her in a Christian school, but my daughter came to me and said, I don't want to be in a Christian school. And so they took her out of a Christian school, and then they homeschooled her for a while. But after a while, you know, as time went on, she came to her mom and said, I don't want to be homeschooled. I want to be in a public schools where all my friends are and all of that. And so they, they took her out of homeschool and put her in a public school. And then after a while, you know, they'd always taken her to church and everything. So one time, as she was a teenager, she came to her mom and said, Mom, I don't want to go to church anymore. I'm just not going to church anymore because I don't want to go. And, of course, she didn't go to church anymore. And then when she was 18, and this was the question that she had for this man, she said, I'm really feeling, I'm in a dilemma now, and I need to... I need to ask you a question. She said, my daughter, she's 18. She's at, she's at home. She doesn't work. She doesn't do anything. But she's come to me and she says, Mom, I want you to get me birth control. And with the whole idea of, you know, I want to be sexually active. What I'm going to preach about this morning, and it's just us, I know... There's not any what I would consider children here this morning, so I'm going, to be, I'm going to be more frank than I normally am because I need to be. She said, I, I, I want birth control. And so she asked this man, she said, what do, you, what do you think? Should I provide birth control for my 18-year-old? And right now, I know right now all of you are you're going through your mind. Some, some of you are really contemplating that. Some of you probably maybe faced that as you raise children, even maybe even now, I don't know. Some of you are considering, say, well, what would I do? I, I know what the world would tell me to do. 
I know what Planned Parenthood would tell me to do. I know what government would tell me to do. I know what the philosophers and the psychologizers and the, and the liberals and everybody that's out there, I know what they would tell me to do there. But see, this woman, her heart is crying out and she's asking the minister. She said, what should I do? And he hemmed and hawed a little bit and, and he said, well, you know, even the New York Times came out with a study and said that even junior high boys and girls are deeply into pornography and that that pornography is changing the mores and the habits of these young children. And I tell you, we can look back to the 1990s and we can thank a certain president of the United States that came out and said a certain type of sexual activity is not sex. I didn't have sex. If you don't think the young people of that generation of the 1990s weren't listening, then you're very naive and foolish. They were listening to what our presidents had to say, and they said since that time that the whole morass of, of junior high kids and high school kids has changed to include everything that's out there. I'm not going to get any more specific than that. But I can tell you we're living in a generation here in 2018, that was very unlike the generation that most of us were raised in. I came into maturity, and then later adulthood, you know, at a time in the, in the early 70s and on into the mid-70s. And yes, it was a time of what they called free love and all that, free sex and everything. I was in the midst of all that, but I tell you what they have today and where it's gone to today has created a calamity for our society like society has never seen. And he went on and he made the statement and said, yeah, things are bad out there and kids are getting into all kinds of things. And he, and he went on and on about that. And then he finally just kind of shook his head and he said, well, I don't blame you. He said, if you go ahead and provide that. I looked at Nancy. I said, did you hear what I just heard and what he prescribed as the doctor of ministry to this woman? And my heart just broke. And I've got to, I've got to confess, I, I, I became a little angry. I didn't sin, but... I became angry at that advice. And I shouldn't have been too surprised because I remember not too many years ago, just a few years, I don't know if I heard it on the radio or I saw it on TV or, or what, but his father also had something very similar. A woman called into him, a grown adult senior citizen woman, and she said, Mr. So-and-so or Reverend So-and-so said, listen, my husband uh, is bedfast. My husband is no longer a proper companion for me. My husband cannot satisfy me any longer. My husband, you know, can't give me the type of intimacy and closeness that I want. And I've been thinking about going out and, and dating other men and, and so that I can have relations with other men. And I thought, well, that's an easy one. Boy, that's a softball. That's, that's a layup there. And I, I tell you, to this day, I could almost fall over. But this man, if I named him, you would all know him. And he said, I don't see a thing wrong with that. You're a, you're a woman that still has needs, and therefore you should be able to indulge in those needs. That was the father. The son oftentimes doesn't fall too far from the father. Some of you are saying, oh, pastor, I guess everybody's got an opinion on that. Well, that's true, and I've certainly got an opinion on it. But I'm telling you what, that's deception. Let me tell you why. Say, pastor, how can you say that? That seems to be a little bit condemning. Let me tell you how I can say that's deceptive. Because not one time in either example did I hear either one of those men say, but the Word of God says this. They're ministers. 
got good hearted people who are struggling to get along, trying to find out what's right and what's wrong. And they got a minister that gives them that kind. Charismatic ministers at that. I'm telling you, that just gets under my skin just a little bit. You know what I'm saying here this morning? My message this morning, if I haven't given it, is called the word first. The word first, and they were talking about that in Sunday school this morning. I said, you're getting all my message this morning. But my blood boiled just a little bit. I was angry. I felt sorry for that mother who was calling in and needed some good scriptural, biblical, spiritual advice. And instead of getting that, she got what she could have called in and asked Dr. Ruth. (laughs) Or Oprah Winfrey or anybody, you know, in that secular sphere. Planned Parenthood, it's called Planned Parenthood. They'll tell you what to do. Oh, my daughter's pregnant, what should I do? Well, honey, you don't want that baby. We can prescribe to you and we can send you over to an abortion clinic. We can take care of that problem right now. That's what they would tell us. But what does God's Word say about the sanctity of life? Somebody, come on now. I know I'm... (laughs) I know somebody is in agreement with me here this morning. I got, I got a question. What, what makes your blood boil? I mean, if you get cut off in traffic and somebody gives you the one finger salute, does, does that make your blood boil? Used to me. You can ask Nancy. I mean, I come from Virginia, and that, those are, that's a fighting sign you know pull up beside him say roll your window down brother you you want a piece of me that's old Doyle but new Doyle ask Nancy in private sometime what I do now I laugh and I'll say I'll wave back I say look honey they're so friendly they're waving at us look at that hey I said, isn't that nice? People are so friendly in this city. Yeah. See, I don't don't allow things like that to get my blood to boil. No, it's not worth it. It's not worth it, you know, or to be yelled at in public by somebody. You know, it's not worth it to get all blood boiled over something like that. Just love them. Just forgive them. When the Bible, Jesus said, when people treat you evilly, you return good to them. You don't return evil for evil. Now, that's what the Bible says. You see what I'm saying? You see where I'm going here this morning? But I'm here to tell you that Jesus did get mad. Jesus did get mad. Let me turn over. with. Are you still with me here this morning? Stay with me a little bit now. And God willing, we'll learn something here today. Mark 11, verses 15 through 17. Mark 11, 15. Look at a time when Jesus got mad. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Now with the doves, I don't see Jesus going in there turning over tables with live doves in it. So those, he just kind of kicked over the seats where they were sitting. But the money changers were all the money was spread out and they, were, and they were taking advantage of the people that were coming to Jerusalem to worship. On those people, you know, he, he just kicked the, pushed the tables right over and the money went flying. He said, get this stuff out of here. And people were walking through with doves and people were walking through with different things to sacrifice. And it was just one big Walmart and Starbucks all rolled into one. And Jesus got mad about that. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those. And he would not allow anyone to carry their wares or their articles for sale through the temple. He actually made a a little whip and was just kind of getting people's attention. Get out of here. You have turned this house into a den of thieves. But my father said from the beginning, this house shall be called a house of prayer. 
That's why you don't see us selling stuff here. We don't sell coats. We don't sell food. We don't sell shoes. We don't sell food. We don't sell CDs. We don't sell, if you see us selling anything in here, please bring that to my attention. If somebody needs something, take it. But God forbid, we have been forbidden to sell anything in this house. Well, that went over like a lead balloon. We heard that from the very beginning. I told Nancy, I said, you better pray for me this morning, girl. Friday, Friday, I'm telling you, I had an entirely different sermon that I, I was wrapping up and I was so excited about it. And in an instant, Friday afternoon, God just did a 180 on me and moved me. I said, honey, you better pray for me today because this is not going to be easy. I went to an expert in the subject of birth control, which includes uh, birth control pills and other types of devices, and the one that is uh, most often mentioned, uh, that being condoms. I went to someone who is a doctor and a dynamic Christian, Evangelical Christian, his name is Dr. James Dobson, who founded Focus on the Family. And he said, since Planned Parenthood showed up back in the early 1970s, teen, now they're the ones that says, abort the children, use a condom, take birth control, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Teenage pregnancy has shot up to the point where it became pandemic. Abortions have skyrocketed to where there's between one and one and a half million abortions every year in the United States. STDs or sexually transmitted diseases have become pandemic. Thank you, Planned Parenthood. Here's what they say. Practice safe sex. Here's a condom. See, they don't tell you the truth. James Dobson will tell you the truth. He both knows the Word of God and the power behind it, but he also knows and understands the science of this. And he says condoms are, are not safe sex. He said condoms are not designed to where they can be safe. He said there's been studies with seen a failure rate of as much as 50% using condoms. And if it doesn't create an unwanted pregnancy, then it very well may create a sexually transmitted disease. And right now in this country, if you're a young person or an older person, like, and you're going out there and you're what they call hooking up the day, and you're just going out and you're just having sex with whomever comes along, you're playing a Russian roulette that makes no sense at all. At least with Russian roulette, and you've got six chambers, you've got a one in six chance of killing yourself, and five in six of not killing yourself, but if you're out there today and you're playing the sexual game and you're going out there and you're being uh, just sexually active and all that, I don't care if you're using carnival, you're, pl you're playing something that is far more aggressive than Russian roulette. Because about half the people out there that are sexually active right now are carrying around a sexually transmitted disease and most of those diseases have no cure. And some of those diseases like HPV that particularly assault women. You say, well, just wear a condom. The condom doesn't protect a woman from HPV. You say, well, how do you know that? Because the experts know that. But the experts in the Planned Parenthood group, they don't tell you that. They don't tell you what's really going on. They don't tell you the, how many women died, thousands of women who died last year from cervical cancer, 90% of them because they, uh, they contracted HPV, a preventable, a preventable sexually transmitted disease, which then turned eventually into cervical cancer, and thousands of women died last year because of that, 90% because of HPV. Didn't matter if they wore a condom. Didn't matter what kind of birth control that they were using. I thank God for people like James Dobson and others that say, listen, that is not safe sex. 
And this is what he said. James Dobson said this, and I completely, 100% agree. He said, there is only, and this is a man, he's highly educated, highly revered in, in circles of all kinds. In fact, back in the 1980s, Ronald Reagan appointed him on his commission. Remember when AIDS was the rage? And all of this was going on, and there was a, just an onslaught of, of uh, all kinds of AIDS and gonorrhea and syphilis and HPV and all these things. It was just becoming pandemic and taking society by storm. So he put him on a, a committee down in Washington along with 17 other men and women, that would, uh, and it was their job to talk about how can we stop this great Travesty that's happening in our country. He was one of only three people in that group of 18 people that said, you know what, we have a solution here and we need you to think about this. And he said the solution that is 100% effective is abstinence. Abstinence is the only 100% effective way. You don't get... You don't, you don't get uh, STDs from the toilet seat or because you use somebody's razor normally, I, although HIV can be transmitted through a razor and an open cut. It's not these things that people, it's through sexual contact. No matter what kind of sexual contact it, it would be, and I'm not going to get specific about that. But he said, that's the only way. And he went on to say this. That the only way to 100% effectively prevent illegitimate pregnancies and STDs, and it's the plan, he said, that God gave us all along, if you read his word, which is abstinence and a lifelong monogamous marriage. Think about that. If you're a young man or a young woman, and you say, I am not... Now, for some of us, it's too late. You know, we've already... We've already passed that. But for us that are still facing that, for a young man or a young woman to make a decision, to make a vow before God, to make a promise before God, and to say, God, I'm depending on you to help me keep this vow. Lord, I am going to withhold myself until I get married. I'm going to remain a virgin. Now, you know what? The kids make fun of people that they think are virgins. Oh, these kids today, there's so much peer pressure out there. Right now, you say, well, go over to Holland High. How many of those kids are virgins? Believe it or not, about 50% of the kids over at Holland High, on average, are virgins. But they don't want anybody to know that because if anyone knows it, they're immediately ridiculed and made fun of and said, oh, you're just a prude. You're just a this. You're just a that. You don't know how to have any fun, et cetera, et cetera. And the boys, they pressure the girls. And the girls, they pressure the girls. And the girls pressure the boys. And all of this peer pressure coming together. But God's solution, God's prevention of that is saying, like, remain solidly abstinent. Hold yourself. That's God's word. That's God's word. And then when your marriage, stay married. And do not do the destructive thing of, of going out on your spouse and bringing disharmony to your marriage and to your family and bringing about divorce and children who are all messed up and et cetera, et cetera. Am I still in the house of prayer here this morning? You know, right now the Olympics are going on and they're making a big deal of that. But I'll tell you, there's one fact that I know about the Olympics that just kind of really taints my enjoyment of it. That the Olympic Committee has taken it upon themselves to distribute over these two weeks 110,000 condoms to 2,800 winter athletes. Now, I did the math on that. I'm thinking, okay, out of 2,800, there's got to be at least 800 that are either married and they want to stay married or have made a vow or they're too modest or, or whatever, for whatever reason, they've decided not to be sexually active with other people other than with their spouse. So I'm thinking probably 2,000, I'm just guessing. But I divided 2,000 into 110,000. That's 55 condoms Per athlete over the next two weeks. Now think about that. 
Let's say you got Johnny over here. He's got his 55 condoms. And you got Ginger over here. She's got her 55 condoms. And they hook up together. Well, they got 110 condoms. Some of you thought, I never thought I'd hear the word condom in a church service. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, hiding behind this isn't going to do any good. I'd rather you blush a little bit and know the truth than to leave out of here and say, oh, oh there must be another plan. Because I was reading in a book the other day, I tell you, the only book I give a hoot about when it comes to getting answers like that is the one that I'm holding in my hand. This is it. This is what I embrace. This is what I believe. I don't care if you're 12, 18, 24, or 94. Settle down, Doyle. All right, let me read a couple of scriptures and we'll bring this to this place. I don't know why God turned this sermon to me. I, I said, God, why? Lord. Oh. <laughs> I wanted to preach something so different. Lord, uh, he, he, he is such an encouraging message, Lord. Why are you giving me this? He said, I'll let you preach the other one too, but this is what I want this Sunday. I have people come to me sometimes, often, it doesn't happen too often. They come and they say, you need to preach on such and such. Boy, and they get right in my face. You need to, Bob. You might as well save your breath. I don't listen to anybody. I don't listen to Nancy. I don't listen to anyone else. I'm, I've only got my ear open to one, and that's God. What do you want me to preach? I don't, I don't decide, well, this will be popular or that won't be popular or this will be received well and that won't be received well or this will be modernistic uh, or this one will be archaic and people will say you're living in a cave or whatever. I just say, God, what do you want? Mark 10, verses 17 through 20. Listen very carefully to this. Then we'll bring it home, Okay. Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Surprising, I think, what Jesus said to him. So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. So if I'm good, I must be God, I think is what he's saying. He says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. You know what adultery is? Adultery is having sex with someone who is not your legitimate spouse. That and along with fornication, there's some nuances there that I can't get into right now. But he said, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. And he goes on to say, and I'll just paraphrase, he said, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, don't defraud. In other words, when your tax thing is coming up, don't say you gave some money to the church and you didn't do it. Don't even defraud the U.S. government. Don't defraud, don't take anything that doesn't belong to you. I was at McDonald's while we were away. I went to a McDonald's one morning and... <laughs> Bless her heart. First of all, she didn't charge me the right amount of money for the meal. I ordered a meal, and it came in far less than what it was supposed to. And I'm looking at the board. I said, ma'am, did you charge me enough money? And she said, yes. Kind of indignant. <laughs> I sure did. I charged you just what I said, okay, I'm, I'm just, I don't think you did, but all right. So I go to my table, and she brings her food, and by that time, she thought about it. She said, you know, I didn't charge you enough. I said, I didn't think so. I said, shall I go ahead and make that up? She said, no, 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 I took care of that otherwise. I said, I don't want you to cover for it. And she said, no, 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 I got a way of taking care of it. Don't worry. I said, okay. So on the way out, I thought, you know, Nancy's at home, and I know she'd like a little something. I had an idea what she'd like. So before I left, I went and picked up something for her. And I, I gave her, um, yeah, it, was, it, it wasn't much. It was just a muffin, but I knew that's what she wanted. It was like $1.60. And I gave her $2. 
And there's a young girl. They said the other one was an older woman. So I'm just letting you know, older women and young girls, they both can get flighty. And men are as well. And she's, she put the money away already. She said, you gave me a 10, didn't you? And I said, no, I gave you a 20. I'm thinking, free money here. Anybody think I did that? I said, no, honey. I said, I gave, I gave you $2. She said, oh, okay. I thought you gave me a 10. Somebody's going to be paying for that. So you say, well, hey, they probably overcharged me before. Listen, as a Christian, you've got to get out of that business and that mentality. The Bible says, rather yourself to be defrauded. Let yourself, let yourself be defrauded and know you're being defrauded rather than make a big deal of something. I said, no, you gave me two. She said, oh, okay. It happens to me all the time. I don't know if it's a test from the Lord or a temptation from Satan. I don't know what, but it doesn't, it doesn't fly. And it doesn't matter if it's $100,000 or $10. I'm going to be standing before God Almighty someday. I'm going to be answering for the way I lived my life. I take that very seriously. Don't you ever think that I don't. I think all the time, probably not a day goes by, I don't think about standing before God to know what he's going to say to me. Well done, good and faithful servant. You, you've been obedient in these things, and you've been faithful in these little things. Come on in. i got some things waiting on you. Or is he going to look at me, who is a Pentecostal charismatic minister, who've cast out demons, who's healed the sick, who's spoken in tongues and given prophetic messages and all that, is he going to say to me, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Take him and cast him out into eternal darkness. Now, you don't hear that message today, but those are the words of Jesus. I take that very seriously, and that helps me to make day-to-day decisions. Walking along in an airport, nobody's around, right? Nobody can see me. I'm all by myself. The bookstore is right there. They're selling the smut and the pornography right there. Oh, Doyle, nobody, nobody will see you. Just go over there and take a peek. God Almighty sees me. I know that if I do that, that's going to produce some fruit in me that's going to be very damaging down the road that could uh, damage and destroy my marriage with my wife. I've got no time for pornography, and I've got no mercy toward it. Now, do I have mercy for somebody that's stuck in it? Yes, I do. Do I know that that's a prevalent problem, even in the church widespread today? I know that's true, even among the ministry. But see, Satan has tempted us and Satan has persuaded us that we can get into smut and all the stuff that goes with it and then just live our lives as long as we go to church and we put an offering in and we walk around like we're just some kind of good Christian. We're going to be all right and then you're going to stand before God. And the Bible says the sins that you send in the closet are going to be shouted from the rooftops. That time you defrauded that, that poor little girl at McDonald's, The time you took advantage of that little girl. Guys, because we wanted to indulge our base instincts. One of these days, we're going to be standing before Almighty God. And anything that's not been repented of, anything that's not been turned from, is going to face us face to face at that point in time. And he's going to separate the goat. He's going to separate the sheep. And the goats will go off into their eternal reward, and the sheep will go to theirs. And there'll be varying degrees of punishment over here and varying degrees of reward over here. What have you done with it? Are you going to be that one that just squeaks in? I'm just trying to, man, if I could just squeak in before the door shuts. Man, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to take that kind of chance with God. No, no, some of you have heard a different doctrine. 
We're hearing a doctrine today. I hear it just as well as you do. It doesn't matter. As long as you ask Jesus to come in your heart, you can live however you want. In fact, I know, I know a very well-known minister right now. In many ways, I respect him, but I, I cannot respect the fact when he says, when you got saved, you, every sin was forgiven you, past, present, and future. Now, what that tells me, if I receive that, if I embrace that, that means, Terry, from this point forward, I can go and I can do whatever comes to mind. I can defraud people. I can have sex with whomever I want. I can lie and I can cheat and I can steal and I can do everything. But it doesn't matter. My sins were forgiven. And when, G when God looks at me, He doesn't see me in my sin. He sees Jesus. I'm telling you, that's a doctrine out of the pit of hell that came in the 20th century. Amen. You've got to repent of your sins. I don't care when you got saved. I got saved when I was just not quite seven years old. Have I repented since then? You better believe I have. Man, I fell on my knees and cried out to God and tears flowed when I was that little boy sitting, uh, kneeling in that altar. <clears throat> But there have been many times since I've disappointed God. There's been many times where I wasn't successful in holding off the temptation of this or that. There are certain things I'm very strong in. I mean, for example, if you came to me and said, hey, would you like a cigarette? Really? <laughs> you want a drink of alcohol? Please? See those things? And I know that's not easy for a lot of folks. But for me, that, that was a never issue. Never issues. Never a moment when I thought, yeah, I wonder what that's like. One time, I smoked one cigarette when I was about 16 years old in the woods hunting. And I had on my brother-in-law's hunting coat. And he had a pack of cigarettes and a lighter. And I smoked one cigarette. I thought, boy, that's the biggest waste of time i ever seen in my life. Amen. That is nasty. So I'm just, I'm just being... I'm, I'm confessing. I'm confessing here my sin, but I guarantee you, it didn't take me long to confess that before God. Now, I'm not saying anybody smokes is going to hell, or if you take a drink of wine, or I'm not saying you're going to hell. I'm saying we have to come before God, and we have to let God speak to us in the Spirit, and tell us, and instruct us, and, and, and lead us into the right ways. I just, happen, I just happen to be very strict in my own personal life. And my wife, she'll, she'll, have, she'll, she'll tell you that that's true. And yet, I, and yet I still don't want to displease my Lord and my Savior. <clears throat> Here's the question. Why do you think those two ministers that I spoke to you earlier today, why do you think they gave the answers they gave? Here's what I think. I'm, not, I'm just speaking thinking about it, why they would have gave those answers to those two women. Number one, because they have given up. And they are waving the white flag of surrender and saying, we give up. Culture and society is just too strong. It's just too strong. And so if you can't beat them, join them. I think the other thing they said, what they said, it was because they want to be relevant. They want to be relevant to a 21st century godless culture. Jesus said to the believing Jews at one time in John 8, 31, He said, if you abide in my word, then you are my disciples. My last text for the day is in Luke 11, 27 to 28, just to pound the final nail in this message. Luke 11, 27 and 28 says, And as it happened, as he spoke these things, that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you. And the breast which nursed you. But he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. 
The fact that you've heard the Word of God this morning, you've heard a gospel response to the societal morays that, that we encounter today in this society, that, is, that doesn't help you that much. We've got to leave here with a determination. Man, this is going to be my map. This is going to be my GPS. I'm not going to let the world and the figures in the world, I'm not, go, I'm not going to let Run DMC and, and Oprah Winfrey and all the societal people out there, I'm not going to let them be my GPS. I'm not going to let them be my rabbi. I'm not going to let them be my instructor. I'm going to say, what does God want? This goes over a whole lot better in the South <laughs> and in the black churches. Man, if I was preaching this in a black church, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, bro. Yeah, it'd be on the walls right now, man. This place would be in chaos right now. People would be shouting and running and praising God. But the Lord has assigned me here. <laughs> And I'm okay with that. I'm happy. Don't, don't mistake what I just said. I'm happy to be here. Boy, if you knew everything that I know, you'd just know how happy I am. You would marvel. I don't tell everything I know. It's all good. It's good. Would you stand with me this morning? You've been so awesome and patient. But I did get a late start today. But it's okay if we take some time and go off the schedule Amen. Yes. <laughs> and, and allow the Holy Spirit to just move. Anybody but me, anybody sense the, the presence of the Holy Spirit here today? Anybody sense that but me? <laughs> so we say, well, wait a minute. <laughs> I told Brother Trent, and I said, Brother, I said, don't you ever ask me again if you can keep moving when the Spirit's moving. I said, Brother, you know. Man, he got that already. He already got my approval. I want to be in a church, and it's going to happen here more and more as we become more submissive to God, more obedient to His Word. I mean, if we could just take the words that were spoken in the Holy Spirit here this morning, before, even before I preached, if that's all we had today, it would take us a week or two to digest it. Do you get that? Do you understand? There are not many of us here, but, but the fact that you're here, isn't that something good? Isn't that something that, that you're happy about? I believe that there's another, at least 500 people in the in the in the five mile radius of Holland right now that are, that are just like these two, Phil and Cindy been running around church to church to church to church trying to find some place where they can just really worship God and hear the truth I think there's another 500 couples and families just like them and the only reason they are not here right now is because they don't know about us you say you believe that? yes I do I see the day when we're going to have multiple services. <clears throat> Man, I'm holding this before God's face every single day. I mean, I am. I'm militant with this. And I say, God, you know how much seed, not just Nancy and me, but so many people have sold into this church. And God we are guaranteed a harvest commiserate to what we have sowed. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Do you believe it? <clears throat> Would you bow your heads with me? Thank you for staying with me a little bit. I had to get that out. Oh, Heavenly Father, I hope no one has mistaken God my demeanor this morning. What seems to be my demeanor is, is that I'm hateful, that I'm intolerant toward people. God, you know my heart. We've had many people come to this church, Lord, and many of them I knew were living lives, God, that greatly differed 
from scriptural and biblical living God, but not once has anyone been asked to leave. In fact, everyone welcomed and shown love at this place, God. I just want people to be in heaven, Lord. I just want people, God, then they stand before you to hear the good word from you. God, I just want people to be saved everywhere because you are not willing that anyone should be unsaved. God, you save those which look entirely unsavable. Oh, God. But look at you. Look at what you do and the work that you do. And look at our lives and what you're manifesting in our lives, Lord. I think about young Keith here. Oh, hallelujah, Lord, he's got things coming toward him that are going to just bless his socks off and are just going to encourage him. And God, you're going to use him for the glory of God, Father. He worked all night last night, but still came to the Bible study this morning so he could be baptized next week. There's something in him that says, I want to go forward, I want to go on. I want to be right with God and I want to obey him. Oh, God, there are many people here just like that. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. God, thank you.